Well, good morning. Good to see you here in person. Those of you who are joining us online, glad you're joining us there. Hope you're tucked in safe and snug at home and uh, enjoying some hot cocoa or coffee as we gather here. All right. Um, wow, what a, what a time to be together. January 2024, right. Anybody find that hard to believe at this point? Like, how did we get to 2024? Right, it seems remarkable to me, but here we are, and we're kicking off with a bang. We're going to be taking a look over the next uh, you know, month and a half or so at this whole notion of generosity. Uh, Serena, as you were sharing your story, I, I loved how that came out, and uh, you know, as you were talking about your heart of, um, you know, I, it doesn't look like this, but, but I've got this, and I want to offer this, and, and I don't even know that I've got that much to offer, but I want to do it. Uh, it was just such a, a great story, and it, um, it, it took me back to the story in Acts chapter 3, where Peter and John are going into the temple for their time of prayer that day, and they come across a, a guy who's lame. He's been lame from birth. They, they, this guy is an adult, and he never got to walk before, and he's asking them for, for money. Like, that's what he does. He sits there, and he begs, and that's how he gets sustenance for himself, and so he asks them for money. And I love their response. It just resonates, and I heard this in your story, Serena, of uh, silver or gold, I don't have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. Right? It's this whole notion of, of generosity looks so many different ways. A lot of times we funnel it into finances, but here is Peter and James. Like, I don't have the money that you're asking for, but what I do have, what I have been given, I give to you. And that so beautifully captures the life of generosity. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at, at the grounding of that generosity because generosity doesn't begin with us. Sometimes we think that generosity is our good idea or it's something that we want to do because we want to feel good about ourselves and we want to feel good about helping other people out. But generosity doesn't begin with us. Generosity begins with God. And so before we look at that in scripture this morning, we're going to take some time and, and we're going to pray together. And I want you to even be, be mindful of the things going on in your life that you're carrying in here this morning. You might be coming in here with a real heavy weight on your shoulders. Um, and nobody else around may even know what that is, but you know what that is. Uh, as I pray, I want to just invite you to, to lift that up to God. Even whisper it out to him on what you need what do you need in these moments, okay? So let's stop and let's pray together. Father in heaven, creator of all that is, Lord, you have revealed yourself in scripture. You have revealed yourself in your incarnate son. God, we pray to you this morning. And we think about um, here we are just a little bit, a few steps into this new year. And we know that you aren't caught up in time the way that we are. You're not bound by terms of calendars. But for us, they're meaningful markers. They help us see things. They help us pay attention to things. And, and we want to do that well as we follow you. And so as we embark on this new year, um, we give you ourselves and we ask that you would teach us increasingly to walk with you, to trust you. And Father, sometimes it's hard to trust you with the hard places of our lives. And so some of us, we come in here this morning and we're carrying the weight of the hard places of our lives. For some, it's a, a sickness. Hard to believe that this year holds for us treatments and doctor's visits. And honestly, for some, it's even a sense of our own mortality. And so we offer that up to you, Lord. We ask that you would bring healing and strength to sick bodies, to weak bodies, to frail bodies. We ask, God, that you would move on our behalf in healing and strength, bringing wholeness. We'd love to see that. So we ask you. For some, Lord, we carry the weight of discouragement, depression, anxiety. 
It's just the ways that our, our mind works and we try to fight it. We try to, to work our way out of it, but it seems the more we wrestle with it, the more we try to work our way out of it, the stronger a hold it has on us. And so we pray that you would, that you would speak into the dark places and bring your light to the dark places of our soul, that we would know peace, that we would know comfort, that we would know joy, that we would know you. Reveal yourself to us, and again, bring healing to those deep, dark places. God, we think about the world in which we live, and we wish that we could have come through this holiday season, turn the corner into the new year, and be reading about lots of peace breaking out over the world, but we get just the opposite. And so we pray that you would bring about peace. We think about Ukraine and ask that you would bring peace into that land. That you would, I don't know how you do it. It's been going on for so long, but we're not going to stop praying for your peace, God. And we ask that you would do it in a way that reveals who you are to everybody involved, that you would bring peace there. God, we pray that you would bring peace into the Middle East to Israel, to the region of Gaza, that, that people would know peace. They would know the Prince of Peace. God, reveal yourself there. I don't know how you want to do it, but we pray that you would. And God, these are just a, play, a few of the couple of the places that just lift up and kept, capture our attention, but we know that there's other places throughout this world. God, we're staring down this year and wondering about what the chaos will ensue in our own land. And we pray for peace. And we pray that you would stir in us by the power of your spirit that we would be peacemakers and known as your sons and daughters because we are peacemakers empowered by the very spirit of God. Teach us to walk in those ways, in your ways. And God, I pray that you would open our eyes to see you more fully today that you would give us eyes to see, that you would give us ears to hear, and that you would give us hearts that are soft and pliable in your care, that, that we, that our souls would be good soil to receive the seed of your word, and that seed would grow roots and bear fruit in our lives that, that is for our good and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. One of the places, God reveals himself throughout scripture, but one of the places that he gives us such a beautiful glimpse of, of who he is, is in uh, the creation narratives. And so we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2 today. Genesis chapter 2. You begin turning in your Bibles with me, if you would, and you can look online if you need to, Google it. You can look on your Bible app online, your paper Bible, if you want a paper Bible and you don't have one, reach in the pocket in front of you if you're here. And we're going to read a, a good, good chunk of chapter 2 in Genesis, all right? So beginning in verse 7, beginning in verse 7, scripture says this, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye, pleasing to the eye and good for food. And right in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where, it, where, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is, is Gahan. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, and it runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. 
the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the wild animals and all of the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then he closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his, and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Hmm. In this story, we see God's abundant generosity. We see that in the forming and shaping of life that God himself, the God who's revealed himself in these pages, the God who's revealed himself in Emmanuel, the son, God incarnate, this God, the creator, he is the generous source of abundant life and flourishing. God himself is the source of abundant life and flourishing. God's intentions float out of his abundance and yield the fruit of flourishing. And this can be hard for us sometimes because we, we wrestle with who God is really. Have you ever wrestled with that? Maybe some of you are even wrestling with that now. You've heard about God. You've even read about God. You hear other people talk about God. But you're wrestling with whether or not you can trust him. Who is he really? Can he be trusted? Is he good? And what we get from these passages, even as we wrestle, listen in, even in the wrestling, listen in because God is revealing himself intentionally as the God who gives generously, abundant life and flourishing. God is this source. Generosity begins with abundance. If, a, if one doesn't have well, it's tough, tough to be generous, right? And one might have, but if one does not give, then one isn't gener generous. And so generosity requires both the having available and the giving. And we see this in the narrative that we're given here in Genesis chapter 2. We see this in other places as well, but we're, we're dialing in here specifically. We see that God has, at his word, everything comes into being everything exists and out of his power out of his abundance he gives and one of the first things we see here is that God gives generous life God generously gives life look again at verse 7 then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground like a little mud pie here he's forming the man from the dust of the ground and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being look at what he did here out of all of his creating, the humanity is the high point, the zenith of all his creative efforts. And he tells us that he shaped it out of the dust of the ground, which means we are of creation. Sometimes when you go to a, a funeral, you'll hear the words, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. And it's a sober reminder that our bodies were formed of creation, of the dust of the earth. And there will be a day when the earth will reclaim our bodies. Anything short 
of Christ's return, we will walk through the doorway of death and our bodies will be reclaimed by the earth from which they came. And so we're reminded that we are of creation, but it doesn't leave us there. It's not just like all the other parts of creation. For God formed out of the dust of the earth and then he breathed into the nostrils, breathed the spirit of life into man. He breathed his very spirit. And so we see in humanity this coming together of heaven and earth, of creation, of the earth, of God coming together in humanity. And part of uh, God's generosity is reflected in this very life that has been given. God generously gives life. Your life. Your life. Your life. Your life is a gift given by God himself. Your life was not something that just materialized out of genetic makeup and DNA. Your life did not materialize just out of a, a coming together of a man and a woman. Your life is a gift from God. Take that in just a second. I, I, I don't want us just to, to, to nod in, in, in acquiescence. Take it in for a moment. Your life, you live and breathe and having, have been. You are a living being because God willed it. Your life is a gift from God, a reflection of his generosity. He is the source of all life and he has given life to you. There are times when we ask ourselves the question, if our life has value, if our life has worth, if our life is really all that it's cracked up to be, listen to the words again. God has given you life. Life, your life is valuable, has meaning, has purpose because God has given you your life. You are no accident. You are no DNA stew that just happened. God has knit you together and he has given you life. We see in Jesus this uh, coming together of heaven and earth where humanity failed to live up to our created commission as heaven, earth, humanity. Jesus, virgin birth, heaven and earth coming together lives this out. And we see Jesus reflecting over and over God's generous life. Not only in his own life, but in the life that he gives we see him giving life in healing, in restoring bodies, um, blind bodies and deaf bodies and lame bodies. We see him breathing life into these spaces. No more so than in front of the tomb of his friend, Lazarus, who'd been in the tomb for four days. His sickness ended in death. And yet before that tomb, Jesus stands and calls out life. It is this reiteration that God is a God of life. And as he reveals himself, he reveals his generous life. But God's generosity doesn't stop there. We're going to read verses uh, 8 through 17 again. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life, were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he goes and he describes the, the headwaters uh, that are coming there, that all come together there, right? This, and and these, uh, these waters are the picture of flourishing, particularly in desert wilderness. Waters are the picture of flourishing and provision there. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. 
the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Right, and so we see here that God provides his generous provision. We see God's generous provision. Not only has God generously given life, but God provides for that life. God made a garden in all of creation. God made a garden. And what are the things that we think about when we think about gardens? Now, maybe you're not a very good green thumb. Like, I'm actually not a great green thumb. So when I think of gardens, I might think of weeds and uh, brown and things that died. But, but for those of you who are good at gardens, like you're more reflective of God's nature and character. Because when you think of garden, you think of flourishing. We've got these neighbors, and, and uh, they've got this amazing garden. And it's right on, they live right on the corner, so every time I leave my neighborhood, I drive right past it. And it's a phenomenal thing to see. Every year, they're out there. They're planting. They're preparing. They're doing all these things. And then throughout the summer, it just grows into this lushness. It's amazing. That's what garden means when we look at garden in Scripture. It's a picture of flourishing. And again, even as he talks about the headwinds or the headwaters of these four rivers, there's both, um, uh, it's this picture of flourishing in the midst of wilderness, in the the midst of uh, uh, a desert of aridness. There are these waters that nourish this garden. There's flourishing. This is a picture of abundant provision. And look at what God says. You can eat from any tree in the garden except this one. Like, look at all of this that I have, I have put you right here in the middle of this. Even given access to the tree of life. And God and his provision. We, we look and we see and there's this flourishing. There's this abundance. And God put mankind right there in the middle of it. God was generously sharing his provision. There's even generosity in the boundary that God puts up. Do you hear that? In in the moment that you eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your soul will be taken from you. Your, Your soul will taste death like you will know death. Surely you will die. Even in the boundaries that God puts up, It is a reflection of his generosity and the abundance. And if we'll pay attention throughout scriptures, we see God's abundance touching down in different ways, in ways that are are little Edens that remind us of God's generosity, his abundant generosity. We see this even reflected in the life of Jesus. You're probably familiar with the story where Jesus feeds 5,000 men plus women and children. He'd been teaching them, and the disciples approach and say, Jesus, time to wrap it up, all right? Good sermon, good talk, but it's time for us to let people go. They need to go find food. And then Jesus says to them, you feed them. (laughs) Good one, Jesus, we got nothing. Like, it would take more than a year's wages to do all this. We don't have the money, we don't have the stuff. Like, how do we do this? And then, again, you're probably familiar with the story, that there's a, a kid, a kid, that's just got a a little bit of a lunch. And this is all they got. They steal the kid's lunch. Nobody ever really deals with that in the scripture. He steals the kid's lunch, brings it to him, brings it to Jesus. Say here, this is what we got. This kid had it and we took it from him. So here, do something with this. And Jesus takes the bread, he breaks it and he gives thanks to the father. And then he says, you give it to all the people. That's a little bit daunting in this moment because you saw this is just a little lunch from this kid over here. What do you, what do you mean? And so he's got these baskets and somehow as they distribute, they, the, the more they give, the more they have. The more they give, the more they have. The more they give, the more they have. And here's Jesus feeding this mass of people. And just to make sure it wasn't just enough. It was abundance. It was abundance. Because then he says, go pick up the leftovers. What? What do you mean go pick up the leftovers? And so all of them had baskets and said there were 12 baskets filled to overflowing of leftovers. 
Are you kidding me? This is a reminder for us as we get to know Jesus. He is a reflection. He is the God of abundance and generosity. He doesn't hoard and keep. He generously provides. And even in this day, God is the God who generously provides. God is the God who generously provides provides and he does so through his followers through his people for in God's economy the way it's intended to work is God brings together in this community God brings together those who have enough and those who don't have enough and he puts them in proximity which is ridiculous it's ridiculous every other community is a uh, separating of these two things those that have enough or more than they need gather over here those who don't have enough gather over here right it's about separation in our world but here in this new community that god is shaping by the power of his spirit even in this day he's bringing together why because he is a god who generously provides God continues to reflect his generosity in our day. So God, we see God's generous life being offered here. We see God's generous provision being offered here. And then we see God's generous commission. You might have heard this as I was reading that section. I actually want us to go back to um, chapter 1. I want want us to read a few verses chapter 1. So just flip your Bible uh, back a page, uh, beginning at verse 27. And we see this commission that God has given, and it is a generous commission. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Now listen, God blessed them, and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. Did you hear this incredible commission that God gave them there? We see it echoed in um, chapter 2, of verse 15. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Right? There's a commission inherent with being human that God designed and that God created. We see this in uh, multiply and fill the earth. Like that's a part of God's intended creation to multiply, to increase in number, and to fill the earth. But notice, as in the filling of the earth, what was humanity supposed to do? They're supposed to rule over it, to take care of it. That in the ruling and reigning, one, it was always with God. Humanity was commissioned, was created and given this commission, this generous commission to rule and reign with God. That because of the way that humans live, all of creation would know who God is. That all of creation would know the love of God, the peace of God, the provision of God. To tend to to creation this was woven into creation and God's generous commission to not only fill the earth but to rule over all of creation by tending to creation right here I'm putting you in this beautiful expanse this garden that by the work that by the work the tending the flourishing work that all of creation would flourish under the rule and reign of humanity, ruling and reigning with God. It was woven into goodness. Sometimes we have the impression that in the Garden of Eden, it was just about hammocks and pina coladas or something, kicking back and chilling. But they were given work. They were commissioned to work, to rule and to reign with God. Of course, we know 
Just turn one page over. Humanity didn't rule and reign with God. They wanted to rule and reign on their own. Because goodness, if I could, if I could decide for myself the difference between good and evil, then I could reign even better. Then I could fulfill this very commission that God has given. And so they took what was desirable to themselves. They ate what was forbidden and they separated themselves from God. And the human experience, uh, experiment went awry. And no human from that time knew what it was to rule and to reign with God until we see Messiah come. This is the beauty of Messiah in Jesus. We see in Christ this, this, uh, this creation commission, this created commission lived out. We see it in Jesus' rule over creation, saying to the storm, be still. And the storm was still. We see his rule over all of creation. And he exercises his rule in such a way that glory would be given to the Father, that people would know who the Father is and what the Father is like. This is who he is and this is what he does. And then he gave that recreated commission to all of his people. You remember when Jesus said that? He said, wherever you go, going into all the world, make disciples. Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. And so it's those same words, those, those same notions like cover the earth, wherever you go in the world, do this thing. What is this thing? To live as disciples, to make disciples. Drawing people to Christ baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Spirit, and then teaching them to obey, that their lives would bear the fruitfulness of obedience to Jesus. And so we see this recreated commission lived out, and it continues to be lived out today. God continues to give his generous commission to his people, that those of us who bear the mark of his grace have been commissioned for the good of the world. That we would live in such a way that all of creation would know the beauty, goodness, power, and love of the creator. Like this has significant implications for our lives, does it not? It has implications for how we work. It has implications for how we tend to creation. It has significant implications in how we interact with other people. Our lives are not our own, but through God's generosity, he has given us his generous uh, commission even in this day. So we see God's generous life, we see God's generous provision, we see God's generous commission, and then did you note that as God gave this to the man in, in 2.15, he wasn't able to complete it on his own. It is not good for man to be alone. Listen to this again, verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. And that word there, azer, is, is a, a completer. In some, t- some places in scripture, it's even translated as savior, the, the rescuer, the rescuing one. In other words, mankind, man on his own, cannot accomplish the commission of God. What was woven into the commission of God? Be fruitful, multiply. You can't do it on your own. It takes two to tango, if you will. And Genesis 2 tells us this. Man cannot um, live in the generous commission of God without this completer, without the rescuer to help accomplish the very calling of God. And so... We read on verse 19, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Now, there was something powerfully uh, happening here in, in naming is ruling and reigning. Naming is ruling and reigning. And so we see that in Genesis chapter one, God named everything that was. Right, And so now, commissioned by God, the man is naming these pieces of creation. And so God has generously brought him into that commission, but he's saying no suitable helper could be found. Like all the animals go by, 
none are going to get the job done. We don't need to go into details. But let's just be really thankful that God saw this isn't going to get the job done. All right? And so the man names all these things, but nobody, uh, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Feared he was probably just there in the lazy boy while the TV was on. It was probably golf, and he'd start to doze off, and somebody would change the channel, and he'd say, no, 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 I'm watching that. So he caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. The Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man, right? And the two become one flesh. And this final statement in verse 25, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. There was this incredible intimacy woven into this incredibly generous gift that God has given. God's generous companion, completer, was a gift that he gave. There are a number of times where this word that's used, Azer, is actually used to describe God himself. It is used to describe God himself. This is a sacred, sacred gift that God has given. And it is a reminder that when left to his own devices, Mankind cannot do it on its own, cannot complete the commission on his own. He must have a rescuer. He must have a completer. He must have a savior. And what do we see throughout the entire Old Testament? We see over and over and over again, human beings trying to live out the commission of God and failing miserably to do it. Because all the time, humanity, and we do this too, are like the new kid who's learning to ride his bike. Dad, dad, just stop. Stop pestering me. Don't hold it up anymore. Just watch what I can do. And this is what we do with God the Father. Say, Father, 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 watch what we can do. And we go and we make a complete mess of the whole thing. It's what we do. And it is a reminder for us, written into the very pages of Scripture itself, as if we needed a reminder because you and I live this same way. We can never live up to in our own devices as men or women apart from God cannot live into the commission that God has given us to be fully human. We need a rescuer. We need a savior. We need an azer to help us, to complete us. And in that completion, as God empowers us by his spirit, we are able to live into the fullness of human flourishing because of God's abundance shared with us through his generosity. God is the one who brings about flourishing. The Spirit himself, God himself, through the Holy Spirit, taking up residence in our lives, is our completer. Jesus, God incarnate, is our rescuer. And without this, all we have is miserable failure. But by the generous grace of God, he has given us what we need for flourishing, for goodness, for righteousness. He has given us what we need to walk with him in a recreated commission where we can know his generosity, abundance, and flourishing. For you see, people who recognize and receive God's generosity reflect his generosity into the world. Did you hear that? Those who recognize the generosity of God are those who, who not only recognize it, but reflect it into the world in which we live. You and I, those of us who have been rescued by his grace, are people who have been empowered by his spirit to receive his generosity. Think for a moment how you have received God's generosity. He has given you his generous life. You are here breathing today because God has willed it so. He has given you life. If you are in Christ, he has given you new life. Scripture refers to it as eternal life. Life that while our bodies will return to the dust, we will live on 
into eternity. God has given you his grace. He has generously given you forgiveness. He has generously provided for you. He has generously commissioned you to in this day walk with him in his mission to rule and reign and renew all of creation. He is in a generous, generous God. And the first stop for us as we recognize that generosity is gratitude and thanksgiving. God, thank you. God, thank you. I even want to challenge you to take the next 30 days and to make sure that you take time every day in gratitude. To name how you have experienced God's generosity. It might be some of the hardest days that you're going to walk through. But there is a way that you have experienced God's generosity. You have life. You, through his grace, have new life. You have a commission. He has provided for you. How have you tasted his generosity? To name that and to do so with thanksgiving. God, thank you for the ways you have generously provided. And then, those who have received his abundance... Share generously with those around them. Has God given you grace? Then there is grace to be given. Has God given you forgiveness? The answer is yes. Then there is forgiveness to be given. Has God entrusted you with material things? You have material things because God has entrusted you. So often we buy this myth that it's all about us, that I'm a self-made man, I'm a self-made woman. God has given. Has God given you material things? Then you have material things to share. Has God given you time? Yes. Then you have time to share. Has God given you energy? Then you have energy to share. Do you see how that works? It's this rhythm of life that God has given us where we receive out of his abundance because he is generous and we reflect that generosity into the lives of the people around us. This is what it looks like to walk with him. This is what it looks like to rule and reign with him empowered by his spirit. The beginning point of all generosity is a generous, generous God. Let me pray for us. Father, we pause in these moments and we give you thanks. Thank you for the life that you have generously given each of us. We are here today breathing and upright because you have deemed it so. And while you have numbered our days, while you have given us life, we want to reflect the generosity of the ways that we bring flourishing in life to the people around us. God, you have provided for us, each in different ways. And out of your provision, we want to be people that have generosity empowered by yours alive in us. God, you have commissioned us to walk with you. You are so generous in that. You give our life purpose and meaning, order and direction. But it is not for ourselves. It is so that we can express your generosity to the world around us. Let it be so. Let it be so. For you are the one who empowers it. You are the one who who completes us. You are the one who rescues us, who saves us. Thank you. Thank you. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Stand with me if you would. You are here on purpose. The life you have is a gift given to you by God himself and it is a reflection of his generosity. May you walk in gratitude. May you walk in hope. May you walk in flourishing as you walk with him. He is a generous God. And as you walk with him, reflect that generosity into the world in which you live. Thank you for being here. If you'd be patient with everybody as you're getting out, the crowd is large. 
but we want to make sure everybody gets out safely. Thank you for being here today. Have a fantastic week. 2024, giddy up. Let's go together. Take care now.